All right, hello everyone out there. So we got a, another intense chapter coming up. Before I get to that, let us review uh, from chapter seven. So let me put that up on the screen, see if we can get that up there. So at night in this chapter, both the Greeks and the Trojan, their leaders, sent spies to the other camp to see what was going on. Um, incidentally, if you hear, there's a lot of thunder and rain going on around here. So it, it's going to actually add to the chapter that's coming because that's actually called Red Rain, interestingly enough. Um, that's just by chance this is occurring. So, but last chapter, Diomedes and Odysseus, they went over to spy on the Trojans. They were going to go to their camp, but along the way, they ran into a Trojan spy named Dullin. He was kind of this weak um, weak guy, wasn't really that confident. And um, But anyhow, that guy, Dullin, gave up all this information about the Trojans, including where these beautiful horses of King Rhesus are. Um, Diomedes ended up killing Dolan um, afterwards, and then they took off, and then they went and stole the horses of King Rhesus, and they killed that king. Wow, it's intense over here. But they killed that king, killed his bodyguards, and then they went back to the Greek camp, and they were celebrating. So if you remember the chapter before, the Greeks weren't looking so good, but now they feel pretty confident. Um, it looks like Bjorn, my dog, going over to check out what's going on out there, too. All right. So kind of some fun stuff here, but it's going to get very intense in this chapter. Again, I'm going to give you another one. Wow, so that was crazy. The power just shut off. So it's getting like crazy outside. This is going to be a wild chapter. Um, anyway, so I was just going to say, I'm giving you another warning. This is a violent chapter again. So this book that we're reading, um, The Iliad by Homer, back then they were intense. This was some some tough stuff. Um, but So just be warned. Okay, here we go. And it is called Red Rain. And check out this picture for the beginning. So we know, we know a lot of battling is coming up. There we go. It keeps going out and in, so we'll see what happens with the power. But dawn was indeed well up in the sky. But over the Greek camp there was little light, for Zeus had spread a churning mass of black cloud across the sky above them. Though where the Trojans gathered on the higher ground, the sky was clear and the light strong. And soon, from the menacing cloud roof, rain began to fall. Rain that was as red as blood. I surely have never seen red, red rain, um, but obviously some mystical, mythical stuff going on with Zeus here. So despite the evil omen, the Greeks were of better cheer than they had been last evening, for Diomedes and Odysseus had put fresh heart into them, if you remember with the King Rhesus' uh, horses. Agamemnon, their high king, put on his armor with a good heart and drew up his front fighters on foot with their chariots ranked behind to support them. And behind again, the spear warriors and the bowmen and slingers on the wings. When the Trojans came rushing down, they charged to meet them. The two war hosts crashed together, cutting each other down as reapers cut their way through a field of corn. So you can imagine, hush, hush, like just cutting people down. Soon the helmets and the bravest Trojans shone deep in the ranks of the Greeks, and Greek swords were slashing and stabbing deep among the Trojans. And all the while, the overarching arrows fell like a dark and hissing rain. So you can see, I'm going to put that picture up of the arrows going. So you, while you're fighting with your swords and your daggers, there are arrows coming down on you. I mean, it is frightening. At noon, the drowsy time when shepherds in the hills make no noise for fear of rousing goat-legged Pan, Agamemnon led the front fighters in a savage charge. With his own hand, he slew many chiefs in that charge, two of Hector's brothers among them. A great and terrible charge in which foot soldiers slew or killed foot soldiers, and chariot men slew chariot men, and they broke into the Trojan mass as fire falls on a forest on a windy day, leaping and racing from tree to tree. So if you've ever seen fire jumping and then it lights up this tree and then another tree gets lit up, you can imagine the fighting like that. Driverless horses crashed here and there, dragging empty and broken chariots behind them. And before their onslaught, the Trojans fell back and back until they were very close before the city gate. So the Greeks are pushing them back. 
And there, under Hector's orders, they checked and reformed their broken lines and drew breath to face the next charge of the oncoming Greeks. So the Greeks are really pumped up and they are like battling the Trojans pretty hard all the way back to their walls. Okay, so here's another photo for picture for the next one. Again, more blood. But that charge broke before it reached them, for Agamemnon had taken a spear gash in the arm, and the wound bled so much that he must he must need climb into his chariot and been driven back to the ships for tending. So Agamemnon's really hurt. And Hector, seeing this, shouted the war cry like a huntsman crying on his hounds against a lion, and rushed forward at the head of his warriors, scattering the Greeks like spray. Indeed, he would have driven them back to the ships again in one great thrust, but Odysseus and Diomedes stood firm amid the rout, slaying all about them. So you can imagine Hector's like, yeah, and he comes charging in, and then Odysseus and Diomedes stand strong, like, no. And they're fighting back. Four of the Trojan chieftains went down to the thrusting of their mighty spears. And the Greeks took heart again and rallied. As Hector loosed the next battle rush against them, Diomedes caught him a great blow on the helmet. Which, though it did not pierce the shining bronze, sent him crashing to the ground. His warriors closed about him with their shields. And in a few heartbeats of time he was up, the light coming back into his eyes. He sprang into his chariot, and the charioteer whipped up the team as they headed away for the left wing of the Greek war host. Diomedes fought on where he stood until Paris, keeping as usual to the fringe or the outside of the battle, saw his chance and loosed an arrow that took him cleanly through the foot and pinned it to the ground. Yikes! And when he had pulled out the arrow, Odysseus covering him with his great shield all the while, it was his turn to clamor painfully into his chariot and be carried back to the ships. So Diomedes got hit with Paris's arrow. Odysseus was now the only Greek leader left fighting in the center, with the Trojans thrusting in upon him from all sides. Grimly he stood his ground and flung them off as a boar at bay flings off the hounds until an enemy spear pierced his breastplate and left a red wake along his ribs. So blood just going down. Odysseus turned on the spearman and as he fled drove his own spear between the man's shoulder, letting out the life. So that guy died. Then he pulled out and flung aside the spear that still hung in his own flank and Gathering his breath, shouted three times to his fellow Greeks for aid. Come help, come help, come help. Ajax and Menelaus both heard his shout and came battling through to his side. Menelaus hauled him into his chariot and bore him out of the fighting, while Ajax, with his great shield, remained behind to hold the center in Odysseus' place. So he's like, and he's got his shield. Then came Hector, thundering back from the left, and the battle roared up around him. Paris loosed another arrow, which sorely wounded Macawan, so that he, whose skill was in the tending of other men's wounds, must be loaded into a chariot and carried back with a wound in his own hide to old Nestor's hall for tending. So basically the doctor, what you would think of as a doctor back then, he just got hit with an arrow, so he's got to go back to the camp. Now, nearly all the Greek leaders who yet lived were wounded and out of the fight, and the spearmen were again falling back. All this while Achilles had been standing in the high stern of his ship, watching how the fighting went and making no move of his own. But when he saw Macawan carried past, dead or sore wounded in the chariot of Nestor, he called to his friend Patroclus and bade him go and find out how it was with him. For if Macawan be lost to us, it will go ill with all the wounded. And here's a image of it looks like Achilles on his ship. Patroclus, remember Patroclus was Achilles' closest friend. He went swiftly and found the healer in the hall of Nestor. 
Hecamede, one of the old king's captive women, was giving him wine with cheese grated into it to revive him, while another pulled out the arrow and dealt with the wound. Can you imagine how painful? Just... Uh. Nestor was launched on a long story about his own adventures as a young warrior, while Patroclus, desperate for speed, stood in the doorway and tried not to fidget. He's like, hurry up, old man, I gotta get going. But when the story was done, he asked his question and was told by Macowan himself that he would live, but that there would be little service to be got out of him for the next few days. So the doctor can't help any of the fallen soldiers for the next couple of days because he himself is too injured. Patroclus was already turning to go when the old king called after him, words that he was to remember afterward. Tell your lord Achilles that if he has still no stomach himself for the fighting, then he should send the Myrmidons out under another captain. You are much his size and, wearing his armor, you could give the Trojans to think that Achilles himself had returned to fight. Then would they be struck with fear, for none of them dares meet him hand to hand. So basically, Agamemnon is, is saying, why don't you change your clothing and get into Achilles' armor so that the other side thinks that you are Achilles? That will scare them off. Patroclus set out with all speed to rejoin his lord. But again, he was delayed, for on the way he met with Eurypylus, another of the leaders, arrow wounded in the thigh and stumbling painfully back towards his hut. Put your arm across my shoulder, Patroclus said, and helped him back to the hut. And then, because the man was a friend and begged him to stay, he cut out the barb with his own daggers He's like, <coughs> behind the wound and bound it with bitter salve to ease the pain. So Patroclus, as much as he wanted to get back to Achilles and tell him what's going on, he had to help his friend uh, heal up a little bit first. So that's actually the end. So it's basically Patroclus on his way to go back to Achilles and maybe he'll go into battle himself. So we're going to see next time. So before we get to the next one, I want to ask you guys, it's going to be one question this time and one face. But so the question is, does anybody have predictions about what's going to happen? So do you think Patroclus will actually fight in Achilles' uh, stead? Or do you think Achilles will even allow him to fight? Because remember, Achilles was not happy with everything. So that's my question for you. Now the face. I want you to be Patroclus when Agamemnon suggests that Patroclus should go into battle and fight. Now, remember, Achilles is the strongest warrior basically of all of the Greeks, and they think he can help them to win. Patroclus is his friend, but to take on all that responsibility, what's Patroclus thinking in this moment, okay? So I'm gonna give you his face. It's like, So that's what I think. What's your face all about? All right. And we will talk next chapter, which is battle for the ships. So this is a battle for are we going to save the ships or not? At least that's what it sounds like. All right. Rock and roll, guys. And uh, hopefully I'll stay safe here with all this crazy weather. And uh, hopefully you're staying safe and healthy and all that wherever you are at. Adios.